So Seamus, I hear that you developed a video game this week and someone else critiqued it for you. No, that's... I, I told you I got a taste of my own medicine, but I did not mean that medicine. Apparently I dish out a lot of medicine. This it's week, like an apothecary. Right? I got a taste of my own medicine because I was a guest on a podcast. Um, if you want double Seamus podcasts this week, I appeared on the A Steve podcast. You have to pronounce it like that. It's it's the rule. It, I appeared on the A Steve podcast um, on Ramble Pack Ramble Pack sixty four, and I was the guest and host Chris. Y you know how when we do the show. If you look at the audio on Audacity, it's this unbroken blue bar of me talking and then these little moments where you barely get a few words in, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so that's exactly what I got when I was on that show. Uh, Chris did all the talking. And I found it liberating. I'm like, ah, I, I don't... I don't have any responsibility here. I'll just relax. <laughs> but he was, of course, just like I always am when I see... And I realize that right now I'm filibustering you like I always do. I realized... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but... I, I, I find it mortifying when I realize how much I talk. Because it feels to me like it's about even. And then I look at the, at the audio later and I realize, holy cow. Paul was barely on the show. I am mostly here to give you a live audience to talk to. Well, I appreciate your patience. Anyway, so if you want to hear me get filibustered, um, Chris and I actually had an excellent conversation about all kinds of things. It got slightly political because he wanted to talk about Twitter. And so we had to talk about the dynamics of arguing on Twitter and you had to bring up the red blue divide there so that came it's up. kind of unavoidable if you step outside of 20 sided tail really right right it's just it 20 sided tail is the foxhole and if you poke your head up you're gonna get shot at <laughs> Um, yeah, so if anybody wants to check that out, there will be a link in the show notes. I was really hoping, I hadn't heard of Hey Steve, I was really hoping that it was like some sort of strong bad related thing, but no, it's just, it's just a nod, I guess. Right. Right, it is. It's just a nod to Hey Steve. I, the, the whole trick with the name is that the person that Chris makes his podcast with is named Steve. But of course, I replaced Steve. So calling it A Steve makes no sense now. <laughs> now that I'm on it, it should be A Seamus. So that's funny. <laughs> so did you finish Eat Shade this week? I did not. <clears throat> I actually. I revisited um, No Man's Sky. I wrote about it last week. And I thought, oh, that's... No, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and I, I wrote that article like, oh, this is much better. And it it was good enough to the point where I just kept playing. And I sort of like, I had some time set aside for East Shade and No Man's Sky ate it all, which is weird. I guess the game is good. I think I'm finally burning out on uh, on No Man's Sky, though. Not because it's horrible and drove me away. It's just like, okay, I've done all the stuff I care to do. And I didn't You've seen it. all 14 quintillion planets and there's nothing left to see? You know, I'm, I'm only up to like 13 quintillion now, so... But I feel like I've kind of seen them all. I mean, I would really... You know, the, the, the criticism I have for No Man's Sky now is that it feels like there are six planets. There are 14 yeah. quintillion of them, but there are really only six in a meaningful way. And they, and I hope a future update adds more variety to the proc gen, because there are just... It's, it's like, oh, another one of these. 
a big sphere covered with alien life. <laughs> Seen it. But really, they could do ring worlds. They could do toroidal worlds. They could do all kinds of stuff if they wanted to. Uh, my chief uh, complaint is really the topography is so uniform from planet to planet. Like, the game changes what's on the the landscape but it doesn't change the landscape if you see what i mean you don't get one with yeah, giant use spiky the same mountains. noise function right and then another one that looks like salt flats it's just always like same same frequency and same amplitude for the the noise there's some variation about you know how much ocean there is but they're leaving a lot on the table in terms of what you can do to generate interesting landscapes. I mean, yeah, a whole yeah. lot. Yeah, they don't have any mesas. They don't have any weird arches or whatever. Right. There, There's so much you could do here. So I I understand it's a hard problem to solve, but that's where I'd like to see the 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 game go in future update. So, sorry I didn't play more <laughs> East Shade. That's what I think of East Shade. Okay. It seems weird that that the main problem with No Man's Sky now is kind of the core point of the game. Whereas before, right. the core point of the game was eclipsed by all the glaring problems with the UI and the gameplay. Yeah, I suppose this is where the game should have been at launch. Like, okay, it's a fun game, but I'd like to see them iterate on the proc gen a little. It, it needs a little work. Like, this is probably where it should have been when the game launched. But at least we got there. <sighs> and I really, I really do appreciate that Hello Games worked hard and made it right at their own expense. I mean, four years, that's no joke. That's a lot. You could have developed another no, yeah. entire game. So they made a sacrifice to do the right thing. So hats yeah, off to them. Yeah, and that's good on them. All right, so you have something in the show notes about embedded programming. This is exciting to me. I've always wanted to mess with embedded programming, but... I've never, ever gotten near it, and I know almost nothing about it. I just think, I like the idea of writing a program once, and you can't update it. So nobody can like, oh, one last change, Seamus. We need you to make a slight change where everything works different. And I could say, nope. The, uh, <laughs> the chips, they're already, they've already got the stuff on them. Everything's being put into boxes. We can't, we can't push an update now. It's physically impossible. So get out of my office. Like, <laughs> right. I love that idea. Yeah, yeah. This isn't quite at that level. So so what I was doing at work was um, programming. It's basically like an Arduino system. Uh, but it's an Arduino system talking to a little touch screen. And the touch screen has its own little program in it as well. It's got macros for displaying stuff. So it's like two pieces of hardware. They're both programmable, but it's limited memory space, limited instruction set, uh, and it's running very close to the hardware. The language is, uh, I think they've got it, Arduino's got this kind of uh, C style language. And then for the for the display, it's uh, it's like a, a macro language with, uh, with command shortcuts and stuff. But, you know, it's, it's kind of like embedded programming. Okay, that's cool enough. That's still pretty cool. So one of the things you can do, to, the normal way you do it is you'd load up the screen with a bunch of macros and then you have the, the computer, the little Arduino, tell the screen, okay, now display this screen with, you know, call this macro, and then it doesn't have to send all the commands over the little serial interface. But you can also send commands over the serial interface uh, for things that need to be updated on the fly, like, you know, numbers or or um, what buttons are selected or things like that, uh, GUI stuff. Okay. So I was programming this thing, and I, I wanted to have a little progress bar. 
And so I took the length of the bar and I divided it by the number of uh, the number that I wanted to get and to give me the number of pixels that was, uh, you know, per per time chunk. And then I, you know, every that time chunk, I would tell it, OK, add another pixel to the bar. And um, the problem is that I did the division backwards. So instead of having like 200 pixels or whatever, it ended up with like one two hundredth of a pixel, and because it was using integers, it ended up with zero. <laughs> oh, so you are fully qualified to design Microsoft progress bars now. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I and and because this isn't like you can't just like compile it and run it on the desktop. Like you have to install it on this little flash drive on the on the processor and then run it and see what happens. So like debugging this is kind of fun because like, all right, well, you know, what did I do wrong and try to figure out what it, you know, where oh, I made the error and you yeah. make very small changes. But when you divide by zero, um, strange things happen. You don't say. So what I, what I would have expected to happen was that the, the Arduino thing would be like, oh, divide by error, uh, divide by zero error, just throw that out and, and like abort back to the the next function up or something. I don't know. It's a void function, so it returns nothing. And then I don't know. Maybe it it like puts it in an error log somewhere, and then just keep going. Um, but that didn't happen. It actually divided by zero and sent the command to the screen. I don't know what it sent to the screen, but I do know that when the screen received the command, the screen did not like it. And, and started going insane. <laughs> Trying so, to draw like, I, an infinity pixel progress bar. I no, it was it was weird because like you, I'd go you know the rest of the UI worked fine, right? You know you push the buttons, it goes around, and then you say like go, and it starts showing the progress bar, and like the screen displays and then there are like pixels start appearing and like running down it's like the matrix right where it's like things are, right. are getting replaced at odd places and like it, I, it must have started overflowing memory and, and writing in random spots in the in the graphics memory or something i don't know but it it was unresponsive you couldn't click on anything anymore and so uh yeah i had to i had to kill that and then i had to figure out why did this happen and yeah who's this divided by zero thing i think i mean i I don't know exactly because I never got in there, but I flipped the numbers around and then worked fine. A classic blunder. Okay, so that's the downside of embedded stuff is you can't debug it traditionally because you put it on some, you're handling it like through a glove box. Like it's just, you can interact with yeah, it, but exactly. it's on the other side of, yeah, it's on the other side of a wall where you can't see the guts, you can't get to it when it's broken. And that makes it hard to work on. And that's that would actually be, you know, I'm always all about reducing um, friction. I want my program to compile and run instantly. And anything I mean, like if I can if I can shorten that from five seconds to three, that's a huge win for me. Where meanwhile, you know, in embedded systems, it's like you compile and then you package it somehow and then you transfer it to this physical thing and then you start it up and it needs to like, you basically need to boot this alien machine that you have no direct control over. And so that's real slow. Um, yeah. Compared to, compared to smacking, I forget what it is, control F7 in... Visual Studio to just like, hey, do I have any programming errors? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that's the yeah. downside. That's the downside of embedded. But I love the idea of there. Here's the thing. I am a bit of a perfectionist. And I love the idea that when you're working on an embedded system, there's a finite. There is a moment where you are done. And you can say, oh, at this point, it must be as good as possible, as opposed to these days where it's like, yeah, we can release it. It's It sucks right now, but we will patch it later, Pinky promise. And then that day never comes. And you just, 
you know all this stuff is just lurking there, this half-finished, half-broken stuff, and you will have to fight in every meeting to get the time to go back in and fix the crappy stuff and polish it and make it yeah. good rather than just, yeah, pushing more features. So I like having that a little bit of leverage over management where you can say, no, this has to be done here. We can't, we can't ship it broken because it will never be fixed. It will never work. Yeah, exactly. Although the state of the heart, the code, it wasn't bad, but there were some things in there where it's like, why, why is this like this? One of them is that there, there's a, a pulse width modulation, a PWM system on the chip. And you can just tell it like digital right or, or uh, what analog right and it automatically does the PWM for you. You just tell it like what percent, you know, from zero to 255 or whatever. And uh, zero to, yeah, 255. And so like it's got PWM built in, but when I went into the code to see how they were doing the, the intensity on the, the LEDs, they had this manual PWM code in there. Like they had written, they've rolled their own pulse width modulation thing. And it's like way slower and, and not great. And, and I was like, why do they do this? Like what happened that they needed to use their own PWM? So I tried to tear it out. And it turns out that like some of the pins aren't set up for PWM. And so you can't enable them. And oh. so, and that, and the board, like the circuit board that this is plugged into, is, is like hardwired into those pins. So I'd have to like manually modify every board until we got the boards updated. And so <laughs> it's like, oh no. And that's that's the problem on the other side of embedded, right? Is like, okay, well, yes, it has to work, but also if you need to change something, maybe it's dependent on the hardware that this thing is plugged into, and you can't just fix it in code. And the hardware guy doesn't return your emails if he doesn't feel like it. Right, exactly. Until, well, I mean, in this case, like, I'm also the hardware guy, and like, that I bastard. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, I guess that's the good side is you have no one to blame but yourself, Paul. Well, I mean, Why I you inherited it? all these problems. Terrible. Sure. I only started last month. So have you been playing this? Have we, have we played video games? I guess you talked about No Man's Sky. I'm talking about right. all kinds of other stuff, and you're talking about video games. Talk some more about video games, Seamus. So, I think it's been two years since Anthem came out. Is that right? Has it really been that long? Anyway, Anthem launched, and it was a looter shooter with bizarre like it felt like a looter shooter made by somebody that never really played them just sort of like watched somebody else play destiny over their shoulder and they were like okay so you're killing a thing and then it drops some loot okay i get it that that doesn't seem too hard and they wandered off and made this game because like all they of had the like a destiny stream going on in the above the pit on the big monitors <laughs> right like, we don't have any concept art, but just make something that looks like this. And they had a big update months after release, and it didn't address any of the problems. But here we got this blog post on the Bioware blog. And for the first time for this project, I they have to have hired somebody. This can't be they figured this out on their own. This is... <laughs> the tone... You don't think they finally got the memo that, that finally they've seen the light? It feels, yeah, it feels like a completely different mindset. Like they understand, the, the problem is looter shooters are basically, they're leveraging the same reward loop that you get in like a slot machine. No, not exactly, because there's skill involved in bringing down this boss, and there's, you know, the excitement of the battle. But at the end, there's this whole loop about, okay, we want the player to win, but we want some of the wins to be a little bit good, some of them to be great, and 
every once in a long, long while, you have a huge spike of, oh, I got something incredible. And we want them to always be, you want people to always be striving for that, that spike of incredible, but still satisfied with their, you know, they invested an hour and they got something nice. Anthem didn't have any of that. It has to have the, the slot machine thing too, where you're in a casino and there's rows and rows of these things. And you can see all the people playing. And so at any one time, somebody somewhere is winning it big and you can see that and you'd be like, wow, that could be me. And so the, right. the multiplayer thing is really important and being able to see like the super epic gear that people have is important because it's that same feeling of like, oh, I'm in this environment where I could win. Yes. Yes. But instead, every dungeon grind was like, you play for, I don't know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and you get a bunch of loot that nobody gets anything good. Nobody's excited about it. They're, even if you get something rare, it's not interesting, often not you immediately useful. You're just going to break it down for materials. Um, there's not, a, in fact, often you can't see what, at launch. I don't think you could see what you got. It would just tell you that you got a rare. And you had to wait until the entire dungeon was over. So it was physically impossible to hear the other slot machines go off. Like, uh, you can't find out if you won or not until you leave the casino. Like, just absolutely breaking the loop. <laughs> they just give you a paper bag and they're like, go home. Right? And it's like that you gotta get out in the parking lot and look in your bag and see if you, yay! And meanwhile, everybody inside is like, I wonder if anybody has ever won anything ever. <laughs> you know, and surprisingly, <laughs> nobody wants to play these machines now. And the right. balance. They're in was, there just singing, like, you haul 16 tons, what do you get? <laughs> just, yeah, it turns the pulling the, the lever into a job instead of a fun thing that leads to reward. It's just like it becomes a literal grind. The, the other problem is that um, the balance was absolutely crazy. Like, you could do a harder dungeon that would take twice as long as the one that everybody, you know, here's another harder dungeon, but it didn't improve the drop rates at all, or it wasn't remotely <laughs> worth it. So it was just like everybody did the one dungeon that gave out, and everybody was sick of it. Everybody was absolutely sick to death of this dungeon. I did it a dozen times, and it stopped being fun after the third one, because it was just empty. It's just the exact same thing over and over, but you and they've only got five, and that's a really low number for a game like this. But there were only five, or it might have even been four, and three of them were pointless because it's just way harder, you know, way higher odds of getting wiped or having problems or getting slowed down. And at the end, it's just the same crap. But then on top of that. The intern, the combat balance was off because the game did this obnoxious auto scaling to everything, where there, you know, you level up and your gear levels up, but then the game does all this sorcery in the background to keep everybody level, so that even though you're a level fifty player with five hundred gear points, and this guy just joined the game and he's level three with fifty gear points or whatever. I don't, I don't know how the numbers work, but you know, you are way apart in terms of power. You're still killing the same monsters, right? Mm, and right. So, so they sort of scale the monster down to your gear score and then, and then figure out how fast you should be killing it. And somebody realized that this means, because the newbies have it easier, the most powerful game weapon in the game by a long shot is your starting weapon. Like it would kill everything in two or three hits where, you know, you're doing this end game grind for ultimate rares that'll kill it in 15. Oh no. Yeah, so not only was the grind, not only was the slot machine like not delivering rewards in a way that made you want to keep playing 
but it was actually the slot machine, your prize when you left the casino every week was that now the handle is way harder to pull. <laughs> and, and you're like, how did it get this bad? This is made by somebody who had no idea how this genre worked. Anyway, the point of this is I am encouraged. I'm not going back to Anthem, but I am encouraged that one, they're still working on it, and two, this blog post really sounded like whoever wrote it understands the genre. And I have to think they either took a crash course where they, like, you know, played a bunch of Destiny and study, and, you know, not just, like, understand the publicly visible knowledge, but actually, you know, attend some GDC talks and talk to experts and academics that have broken this genre down and learned how to do it, or they hired somebody that knows how to do it. Because this blog post here two years after release, when they talk about their design, seems to actually understand what the goal, how this casino should work. So, better late than never, Anthem. So, so hang on. Anthem, like, Bioware doesn't get any brownie points for sticking with it and fixing their game, and even though No Man's Sky does? No, they, no, they do. I'm, I'm giving them the most No, good. You stuck with it. It's weird that you made this game without knowing how this kind of game works, but I am very glad to see it turn around. And, and, Have they and actually the, made any updates, or are they just saying yeah, that they're going to make updates? That, that's the other thing here, is that, okay, the talk is now correct. A year ago, last time I checked on it, like, all of their posts made no sense, and their updates made no sense, and did nothing to alleviate player gripes. They're all making posts for the stockholders and stuff. Right. Or just addressing, oh, we're going to give you more decals for your armor. And it's like, no, but it doesn't, you know, they're talking about adding more content. And people right. didn't want more content. They want the delivery of the content that's there to be more interesting and balanced. Now they're they finally want the existing great. content to make any sense at all. Right. But now they're finally, they have the right mindset. And, I mean, a scene, you know, taking this at face value, they seem to know what the game needs. And they have a plan for addressing it. So we can give them that No Man's Sky, no Man's Sky style cheer when they finally come through, you know, on year four. <laughs> <laughs> Another two years. I mean, it's probably going to take a while. You, you know, if you're going to dig down... It's, it wouldn't have been that hard to do it before launch. Well, it was because, you know, the development was hell. But, you know, in a coherent project, it wouldn't be that hard to change before launch. But now they need to change the system post-launch when people are already walking around with rare gear. And, okay, we have to... Any changes we make to the system have to honor the extant gear. And... And... That's tough. That's tough. Well, is it though? I mean, if the starter pistol is the best weapon in the game, couldn't you just start by making all the epic gear good? Right, but does it scale relative? <clears throat> like, you need to adjust its power level of everything. And sometimes you might have games with your guns with some incomparables. And this gun that used to be the quote-unquote best gun of you know of the high level guns would become not so great and then everybody that was relying on that gun would be really pissed it's like i built my i made my entire build around this gun and i don't know why i'm doing the idiot voice that's a perfectly reasonable complaint <laughs> <gonna> ask you <laughs> why <laughs> i just that's my default voice for people who post angry in forums it's even even when they're correct, that's just like... <laughs> the bro shooter voice. Right, well, I put so much of my life into this game, man. You, you're stealing my life. <laughs> it's like, stop playing it. <laughs> but, you know, if somebody designed their entire build around a particular gun, and now that gun, just because of the way the new numbers work out and the new balance mechanics work out, oh, that gun is actually... 
not that great now. You're going to have people be very angry. And it's going to be very hard to adjust and understand what why the system is or is not working in the midst of all that noise. You know, some people... Yeah, when, yeah. You know, An established community with established patterns and all the players have been here. I mean, if they've hung on for two years in Anthem with it being all broken and crazy, they've got to be committed to something. <laughs> right, the Stockholm Syndrome is set in. So maybe you don't need to worry about them leaving, but you do need to worry about them just complaining you to complaining at you to death. And I can't judge. I mean, this is what I do. You know, I could have stopped after Mass Effect 2, but I kept going. I had been warned. <laughs> I knew what I was getting into, and I did it anyway. And then I complained about it for over 100,000 words. So I, I have no room to judge these people. You took back Earth, Seamus. <laughs> <laughs> Take Earth. But here, you can have it. It's been slagged. It's ruined and everybody's fucking dead. Here you go. You win. <sighs> We're talking about Mass Effect again. I seriously... My therapist we, we says care I'm about progress. But I don't think that's We true. don't care about, like, all the people died. It's, it's some kid. That's the important thing. <laughs> right? That's <laughs> it's right. All right, maybe the mailbags will save us. I'll take this first one. This one actually is the most recent, but I really wanted to answer it. Okay, so this one is long, so I'm going to summarize it. This, um, this email is about Dark Souls, but it's more about the punishment. And it talks about how you know, brutal punishment, but the punishment needs to be there. So what if games could use physical pain just as a thought of experiment? Imagine Dark Souls when you die. The machine somehow delivers the sensation of being punched in the face to you. And, um, but it doesn't, you know, leave a bruise or ongoing damage. It only lasts a few seconds. And that would be your punishment. So now you have a disincentive. You have an incentive to play well, but it doesn't need to waste 10 or 20 minutes of your time. You know, because... So, ah. Yeah. So that is the question. It's much... Long, there's, there's some more nuance, but I kind of wanted to do that high-level overview. It's from... Castrelius again. Thank you for the question, Castrelius. The entire question will be in the show notes um, for those who want to read it. Yeah, it's this kind of that sword art online angle of like, what if you could be in your favorite video game for real? Sword art online, is that an anime about an MMO? Yeah, it's it's not great. Anyway, I, like, would okay. you would you play would you play Dark Souls if this was the mechanic instead of like having to run do a corpse run you just got punched in the face? No, and see, I think that one of the things where I differ from a lot of people, they're like, well, you need an incentive to play well, you need a punishment, or people will just you know like walk up to the boss and just like lazily hit the attack button. No, I mean, if the game never punishes you, then why get better at it? Yeah, you just walk into the arena, slash dance, walk away. Right. But for me, um, because I'm a perfectionist and because I like to master, I mean, if the game can be mastered, I want to be able to get through fights with no, no damage. So for me, getting hit is the punch in the face. I'll end a fight where I'm like, you know, Batman versus 20 mooks, but I got punched once in the, I mean, Batman got punched, not me. Batman got punched once in the middle of it, and I will walk away frustrated, like, ah, I can't believe I let that happen. Ugh. And so, for me, that, that in-game punishment of watching my health bar go down is enough of a punishment to motivate me to get better. So Dark Souls, 
the corpse run or whatever, or like in Too Human, where it just makes you watch like a 20 second cutscene before you're allowed to play again. I, I've never played Too Human because of that. I would absolutely lose my mind if a game did that to me. Uh, that just feels like salt in the wound. Like, I don't need that. In fact, I am so motivated to keep fighting this boss until I get it just right. And in fact, I, I wish there would be a, a way that if you beat the boss, you would get the option, are you happy with how you just beat that boss? And I would say, no, he hit me like six times and I had to drink two health potions. I want another go. I want another go. I want to beat yeah, him yeah. without needing... You want this to be Guitar Hero, where it's like, right. I didn't get an S double plus, try again. Right. And so, for me, I'm already being punished really... I mean, the punishment is really coming from within my brain, but, you know, from... It feels like the game is already punishing me when the screen flashes red and my health bar goes down. And I know I'm not perfect. I think it would be cool if a lot more games had that kind of system of, like, ranking runs and allowing easy retries. Yes. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love that. Especially in these very mechanic-driven games like um, Star Wars, Jedi, Fallen Order, whatever that I'm currently writing about, um, or Dark Souls, or any of its progeny. I think this is also why I like shooters, because in shooters, it is not possible. It, shooters free me from this sensation of needing to be perfect. You know, okay, it's a hit scan weapon, it's controlled by a random number generator, you're just trying to keep the damage from getting too bad, but there is no perfect. So it's okay to get through the fight and take a few hits. And then I don't, then it's mm. less, yeah, then my brain isn't like, you, you're not perfect yet. Keep going until you get perfect. And I can just enjoy the game because I'm not being punished by my own need for per mechanical perfection. So that's probably why, and it might be a big reason why I love Half-Life. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm just freed from that and I can just in, sort of enjoy the atmosphere of the game without this constant nagging sensation of um, inadequacy that's interesting so you want it to be able to you want to be able to get be able to get good at it but if you can get too good at it then you're not going to have as much fun because you know that you're not good enough yet right right i'll never be and i'm never going to be you know a perfect player I'm, I know, I don't have the reflexes or skill to, to get there, but that's that's the goal. Although, I've, I, I do very, very well at, at Batman Arkham City. I get through multiple fights without taking hits. And, you know, so I, that's, that I can finally, after going through the game like eight times, I'm finally good at it enough that I can just enjoy playing it the way I enjoy playing Half-Life. I don't know if that's good. But, yeah. It's one of the things I enjoy about Noita, is that it feels like every time I got hit was my fault. And it was like, okay, I could have yeah. avoided that. I could have been more careful. I could have approached that in a different way. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's a good feeling of, of playing a game where you know that your skill matters. Yeah. And you can feel the the sensation of getting better at a game. That feels really good. A game that um, where your second trip through the game, you're like, I remember this fight being very hard. And now that was a joke. I steamrolled that guy. It wasn't even a big deal. That feels good. But you don't get that until your second time through the game. Because the escalating difficulty of your first trip through the game, you don't ever feel like you're ahead of the curve. Like, if you do somehow get ahead of the game, you just think, oh, they, you know, the game's taking it easy on me. You don't have, you don't have a, a way to measure yourself against the game. Unless you're playing Dark Souls. Unless you're playing Dark Souls. 
even then, uh, I, I think, you know, it changes up the enemies as you go through the game. So you're not fighting the same guys over and over. Right, but you can revisit previous areas, whereas in a lot of That's RPGs true. and stuff, you yeah. keep progressing and you can't ever get back to Narshada or whatever. Right. Right. And that, yeah, that actually feels, that feels good even in an RPG like Diablo, where you know, okay, I'm not more skilled at clicking on shit. I just am 50 <laughs> levels higher than the last time I was here. And it just feels hilarious. I can remember when this was so tough. And now guys are dying when they try to hit me because I've got, like, reflective damage on my armor. <laughs> right. Thorn's aura. <laughs> right. It's just like, just walk in, walk through the area and everything's falling over dead. And that's sort of, it's a little childish and indulgent. But yeah, it feels good to be a little bit childish and indulgent once in a while. It's, it's nice. You feel like you earned it. I feel like you should play Monster Hunter, because that's been billed. I've never played it myself, but it's been billed to me multiple times as, like, really execution-focused, skill-based, uh, kind of third-person-y combat stuff. Hmm. You're not the first person to suggest Monster Hunter to me. Maybe I'll check that out. Uh, there, there was also there was another email that did not make it into the diecast that someone sent me. Is like, hey, um, how about near um, Automata or whatever it's called? And that's another one I've been meaning to come back to, and I haven't yet. And I meant it. I meant to spend more time with that. I had. We went through the whole summer drought. There were no games for like five months because nobody wanted to release during COVID, and I could have went back to that game. And instead, I don't even know what I did with the last five months, besides moving. Like, what have I been playing lately? I don't know. So yes, No Man's Sky, improbably. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, like, where'd the last five months go? I don't know. Uh, so, yes. Monster Hunter, I should check out during the next lull and near Automata. I need to get back to that because I really liked I really liked my first playthrough and a half of that game. Did you get all the way through? I thought you stopped playing because you couldn't, like, it kept crashing or something. Okay, playthrough is a bit of a misnomer because you, you beat the game... And then you start a new game, but this time you're you're seeing the same story from the perspective of someone new. And that happens over and over again as you play through the game and see this story from all these different perspectives. And so they talk about ending A, ending B, ending C. And they're not talking about like at the end of Mass Effect where you choose which ending. They're talking about like which particular story mode did you go through finally. Right, right. It's like different and, braids in a single cord. Exactly. And I got, I mean, I, I don't know, there are a lot, like more than 10, I think. And you probably need to do all of them to say you really finished the game. And I got through the first main one that sort of in, introduces you to, um, uh, I, to the main arc that all the other story threads will be wrapped around and I got halfway through the second one where you play as her side you the first time you play through as this girl and the second time you play through as her sidekick and I got halfway through the sidekick playthrough and I was like oh it's just crashing too often I have to shelve it but now I have a new computer it probably won't crash as much and I I could check out the rest of the game eventually neat so here's another long one. Dear Diecast, with a series on civilization wrapping up, I wondered if you've ever come across what Sid Meier calls his covert action rule. And he's got a link to the Wikipedia article about this very rule. And uh, then he says maybe it explains some of the things. And uh, yeah, the whole thing is going to be in the show notes. Have you ever run across covert action rule? I have not. And here's the funny thing. This obviously came in... Uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, it didn't make it onto the show notes at the time um, because, it, you know, there were other emails coming first. And then last week we had Soldier Hawk on. So this is coming in, uh, you know, 
couple weeks after this person sent it in. I thought it was really interesting. It came in before the end of my the final entry in my Civ series where I criticized the combat system of the game. So I thought that was really interesting. I you know, I had this whole this whole post ready to go criticizing the turn-based combat of the Civ games and then here comes somebody asking about it. And when this came in, I read on the covert action rule so that I would be prepared for the diecast to answer this question. And now it's been two weeks and I don't remember a lick of it. Nothing. Pfft. That part of my brain is filled with dust. I have no idea what I read. <laughs> it's just the it's just the sound effect from Strong Bear where it's like <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Sickly Sam when he when he just coughs away. That's right. All right. Having skimmed this once again, it looks like Sid is talking about he made um, a game called Covert Action, which I've never heard of. That's crazy. But he made he made a game called Covert Action. <laughs> And it had, it was a very modal game. You're doing story, and then you're doing the combat. And each of them could have existed on their own as a standalone game, but they fought with each other. And each of them distracted from the other for a long time. So you'd come out of combat, and you kind of have lost the thread of what you were doing in the, in the intrigue of the story because the the battles were too long and involved. And so the covert action rule is just don't try to do too many games in the same game. And I would say XCOM is the most notorious game to violate this rule and be good anyway. Because it has mm, right the yeah, the turn-based section like the meat of the combat is this turn-based thing but then there's this almost you know in another dimension you have this base building and real-time management sim that you're running and it shouldn't work but it really really does yeah but, and i think it's because they're so well integrated right like you're you're managing your crew when you're doing the base building and it's so that you can have them on hand for the combat missions and the stuff that you pick up in the combat missions plays into what you can do with your base and so they they feed back into each other so you never like completely forgetting about the overworld or completely forgetting about your team you always kind of have them both in your mind at the same time right and so that's it really interesting and he makes that a rule now you know don't have two games that don't have two different game modes that fight each other in when you're making a game although civilization is also has this pro that that the interesting thing was if i if i read this before i finished my civilization series i could have put this in the last entry because it violates the covert action rule you are doing this huge grand scale simulation management sim and then all of a sudden a war breaks out and you're doing you know a turn-based combat game and the the sort of civilization the pace of your civilization management just slows way 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 down when you're not at war a turn is you know 15 seconds and when you are at war a turn can be five minutes and so it it feels like the core gameplay fades into the background so that you can move these minis around the map and have them fight each other so it's right. like you're you're and playing a, there's the there's the city management too it's like three different games i know when i was playing civ i would always be like all right I'm, i've got this whole plan for the city i figured out like the next 50 turns and all the improvements I'm going to build and all that stuff. And then like, I go to another city and I'm like, okay, I figured this one out. And then like, go to the next turn. I come back to the city. And I'm like, what is, why do we even have this city? 
Right? Why does this place exist? Who are you people? Why are you part of my empire? I don't remember you. Yeah, I always felt like there needed to be better planning tools. Like, when you're in a war, I want to have, like, a world map with all the big arrows, right? For, like, the invasion is going to go this way, and here's the main thrust, and here's the flank and stuff. And then, like, right. when I'm building a city, I want to be like, okay, here's the master plan. I want to have the, the, the road going this way, and I want to put the mines over here and stuff. Have some sort of, like, sketch thing where you can sketch it out so that when you come back to it, you'll be like, ah, oh, yes, good. But the plan is going according to plan, or oh, we need to adjust it somehow. But there's like there's no tools in the game to let you make plans. It's always just like, what action are you going to take right at this moment? Right. So you come to a military unit. Oh, a tank. Um, uh, I guess I'll take it west. There's some towns over there, and then it comes to another guy. Oh, oh, this guy's moving around. Oh, but wait, he doesn't. He was had some support units with him. He had a tank. Oh shit. I stole his support <laughs> units and, you know, went somewhere else with them because I couldn't keep track of what all these units were for and what they were doing. Yeah, and, yeah. And, like, I want to have a siege army and be like, this army's plan is to go siege that town. Oh, good. Well, keep doing that then. But instead, it's just right. like, here's a, here's a unit. What do, you, what do you remember? It's like a quiz every time. What do you remember about this unit? Right? And I'm like, I don't know, I've got 50 guys exactly like him. I can't tell which one this is. I don't recognize this corner of the map. Wait, am I... I'm not at war with this pe these people. Why am I in this territory? And there was some really good reason for me to come over here three turns ago, but I've got yes. no idea what it was. <laughs> I was doing was something I that I thought... Was I planning to betray them? Was I doing scouting? <laughs> Did I see some barbarians over here? Is am I? It's like, are they being invaded? And they asked me to be here. I I don't understand. Or did, was I just walking through and they planted a city and it became their territory without me noticing? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's too much. I my problem is I don't have enough cash memory in my physical brain to keep track. So all of these tasks keep getting dropped out to the swap file on the hard drive and then it takes so long to bring all that stuff back into memory when you come back to it a good fast processing but not a lot of cash <laughs> so that's very interesting that this came in right at the tail end of my um sieves here this would have made a better this would have made a better discussion at the end of that series but um, yeah, it didn't. All right. Um, let's do one more. Hi, Seamus and Paul. Glad you're both moving through the recent bumps in the road. I was wondering what your thoughts on PC hardware are going through into the next generation of consoles. Seamus's PC was basically god tier level when he got it, but the upcoming hardware, both on PC and the Xbox Series X, looks like it's going to blow even that out of the water. Do you think there will be a huge divide between those who have ray tracing on and those who have it off? Does supporting those different rendering techniques and vastly different hardware performance levels effectively double the work for de developers? It seems like a nightmare just as we are getting out of the limitations of the current generation of hardware. I was expecting big, open, highly detailed worlds, but it seems like putting in ray tracing, while a really cool and probably endpoint rendering technology, we're going to be limited in the types of spaces that can be made when those effects are implemented because it'll just be too taxing. All the best, duo -A. Never get tired of saying that name. Thank you for the question, duo -A. So I am... I am not sure about this. My sense is that hardware has mattered less and less and less. Like it used to be, oh, my computer's two years old, I can't play games on it anymore. But now the, the most common thing people say about hardware in the comments is they're like, yeah, my computer is eight years old, so sometimes I have to turn the settings down to low. <laughs> like, this is such a <laughs> right. This is such a crazy world, and it's so nice. My last computer was six years old, and 
I could have gotten, I mean, it, it was starting to struggle at six years old, but I was still play, occasionally playing a game at high settings, even with the six-year-old machine. And this new one just handles everything I throw at it on highest settings. Sometimes I turn settings down because it's just, I feel like I'm just wasting electricity. <laughs> like, okay, I can <laughs> bump up the, I can bump up the resolution to 4K or something insane, or I can turn, but I can't see the difference. <laughs> Actually, you could, I can tell 4K, I can tell when I'm running in super high res. But, you know, oh, this anti-aliasing, throw anti-aliasing on an already 4K image, and it's like, I... I honestly, I can tell that the frame rate went from, you know, 200 frames a second to 140. So, like, you know, it's it's a lot less heavy, but I can't tell. It's just making the fans in the box spin faster for no reason. <laughs> you're you're turning down the settings just so it's quieter in your room. Right. Right. It's so sad. and games look so good that even when you play them on crap settings, they still look fantastic. Like I played East Shade and I was like, oh, this is so beautiful, but the pop in's a little bad. And then I realized it was playing on absolute bottom most lowest tier graphic settings. And it still looked fantastic. You know, still was really pretty. Although that's more about art style. Actually, that's not fair. They had a really pretty art. Anyway. Well, so it does I, say something for the importance of art direction as opposed to pure technical uh, hardware throughput. That's a really good point. Yeah. You, and I, th I keep thinking that maybe developers have figured that out. Like, you know, we, we need to focus more on our art and less on our engines now. Certainly, games aren't pushing as hard, or it doesn't feel like they're pushing as hard. I, well, and it's so important to, it's so important for the success of a game to be to look like it has a consistent presentation. It's not so important that it has the best possible presentation, or or the the most demanding yeah. possible presentation. So I'm not sure about this next gen. Like, how are they selling it to us? What are they going to sell us on? I, I mean, everybody loves the look of the new PlayStation, and they're excited for it because, the, you know, the old one is old. But when it comes right down to it, what's the magic that we're getting? What's going to make me feel, oh, wow, I am so glad I just dropped 500 bucks on this new machine. Well, I guess ray tracing, probably. Right, but we haven't really seen any, like they haven't showed off any ray tracing yet, or at least I haven't seen. The only ray tracing I've seen is, is like homebrew demos on the PC and, and the game control for some reason. Everything else is just like, oh, get, and I've seen people complaining about this, like the new generation is like, look at how pretty the box is. And there's not a lot about the next gen games we're getting. And I, I wonder if this is a problem that the next gen is going to have where you have to, okay, this game looks better, but does it look $500 better? Is the, is the new port of GTA 5 really going to justify me buying a new machine and then buying the game again? I don't know. So, I the answer to this question is I don't know. I feel like we haven't been shown enough for it to matter. I would be pretty happy if there was some justification for me buying even better hardware because I just like having nice hardware. But yeah, at this right. point, like I've got a, a one year old computer and it wasn't cutting edge when I bought it, but it was it was fine. And and like there's nothing on the horizon that makes me think that I'm going to be buying new hardware next year. Right. 
um, things have been getting good on the PC side. Like, we're at the good part of a console generation. You know, PCs are always doing great on the back end of a console generation because PCs overpower consoles by enough that shitty ports don't drag them down. Sure, you're wasting a ton of processor cycles, but we've got them to spare and we can turn all the settings up and, and get this amazing version of the game. Um, so I don't know. Are we going to have another really hard hit where suddenly your gaming PC will be completely inadequate and games will run horribly for because obviously everybody targets the console first. That's the priority. And then the PC port will be terrible and will run poorly and the resolutions won't make sense and you will or you won't be able to change it and everything will be stupid and broken and frustrating. I hate that. And I've, it wasn't really bad for this, the generation that's ending now. That was never bad. Even at the beginning, things were pretty smooth for PC gamers. And then they got better as the generation aged. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I, there's nothing I'm afraid of yet. I haven't seen anything that's made me worry. That's, that's the best I can say about the next gen. And the PlayStation 5 is very pretty. And the Xbox Series X box series X box, whatever it's called, whatever, <laughs> whatever this new box is from Microsoft is a literal box. It is a cuboid, which exactly matches my, I could have two black obelisks on my desk side by side and you wouldn't be able to tell which was the PC and which was the console. And so far, I'm not afraid of either of them. I have high hopes for this generation. And I'm really hoping this ray tracing stuff takes off, because I dig it. Yeah, ray tracing, man. It's good It's good stuff. It's It's been like 20 years since I was this excited about render. It's been since bump mapping. That's the last time I was this oh, excited yeah. about a new thing. Yeah, bump mapping was such a big deal when it came out. And this, this is the, the, it took us 20 years before we had another, another bump in quality of similar magnitude. So yay, fingers crossed. Okay, we've definitely done a show. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question for the show, the email is diecast at shinsyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. woke up about half an hour before we started the show so i'm still i've still got the cobwebs in my throat yeah and so i've been well, sparing you get you. enough sleep anyway <laughs> yeah but i've been sparing you the worst of it but i'm like hacking up a storm over here thank goodness for push to talk this would be unbearable without it and now we have a stinger for the end of the show there we go isaac that discussion we just had you can stick that at the end of the show